I remember back in 2013 when I was trying to enter the profession and it seemed tough as nails to get in. Now, I teach in Texas and at that time, if you were not certified, your chances of getting hired were just slim. Now, fast forward to 2022 and we have triple digit shortages that are pretty unprecedented since I've been in the classroom. But with all these shortages, here's an interesting question. Now, why am I sticking around? What's up everyone? Welcome for the first time back to another Deshaun Johnson video where we talk teaching, writing, and some bonus items. And in this video, I present to you seven reasons why I'm staying, why everyone else is going away from the classroom. There's a biblical scripture that states the following in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11, King James Version. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers. Now, while this scripture may be only referring to teachers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it was apparent to me that teaching takes a different approach because you're providing people of all ages some sort of understanding. Even if you don't believe in a Bible, I believe that the nature of teaching is a calling for purpose and fulfillment. Now, it takes a certain type of person to be made to be built for this profession. And I got news for you. If you're in it just for the perks and the paycheck, then you'll leave yourself frustrated, ready to leave after only just three months. Now, I personally conduct myself on, a, on biblical principles when it comes to student interaction and self-control, such as it states in Philippians chapter 2, verse 4. Let every man not look to his own things, but let every man look also to the things of others. Now, scriptures like this helps me to be more selfless than selfish, which adds to the success of my room. Now, I want to be clear that I'm not walking around just quoting scriptures to kids or any of my colleagues. Now, it helps me to live by example, standing on the word to experience success and what needs to be done in the classroom. And for that, I won't make any apologies. Back in my 2017 video, I specifically lay out how people make money off of this profession. Problems lead to opportunities and public education is just ripe for the taking. It's just full of them. <laughs> I've only been like teachers with only 10 years of experience leave the classroom because they, like many others, have found some like miracle program or software or something to solve all the classroom ills. However, I can't hate. These teachers are leveraging their albeit brief experience to sell a district, a training course, some sort of book, or even software that's supposed to improve the classroom experience by leaps and bounds. Man, if I can recall correctly, there was a lady that I did a training with my first year in middle school who had a program built on the all students need a visual ideology, meaning that she was selling teachers the idea to use pictures basically everywhere. And I was using pictures to illustrate our procedures, emergency strategies, basically just using less words and more pictures. That was her solution. My principal at the time told me that they paid her a pretty penny, which I can only imagine was in a five figure range for her little one day visit. But see, this is what I'm talking about. If you have a sliver of success in the classroom, then you could just simply package that in a nice little bow and sell it to those who were just in the struggle. So, for example, maybe you're killing it in the classroom in, in classroom management. All right. But at a Title One school that's gang infested, but you won in getting the gang members to respond to you in this like Hillary Swank fashion. Now, you could take that experience and write a book or sell a course to teach other teachers how you managed to win over the gang members. And personally, I'm not teaching gang members, but that's still a book or course I think I would want to buy. But more importantly, you're able to make software that you can charge a district a recurring monthly fee or license seats, which for that, I have a different opinion on that business model. But whatever, that would even be better because that's an even higher profit margin if you could sell the software successfully. Now, if you're savvy, training your eye to see opportunity within the problematic circumstances, education can be a nice little mint for you. Now, there's no such thing as job security, right? Now, to a degree, I beg to differ. Now, teaching is sort of this mixed bag. So, for example, if times are good, districts and campuses go to the extreme of becoming real selective, just like when I went through the hiring process back in 2013. Tenured teachers don't retire from their positions and campuses put you in the reserve stack of applications uh, for when things really hit the fan. And good educational times, just like it says in the Bible, you'll have a better time getting through the eye of a needle than getting a position as a teacher. But those days are way behind us now. We're in a perpetual state of desperation where districts can't keep adults in the classroom to, at the very least, monitor kids. Some of y'all may call that babysitting. In other words, we're officially in hard times. 
And when hard times hit, you have certifications, great experience, and a good rapport among previous administrators, then you can almost write your own ticket to work in almost any district. Now, times are hard now regarding the state of public education that even if you had a bad year, all will be forgiven in the almighty administrative eye. So if you focus on doing a good job and rising above the vitriol, the challenging students and inappropriate parental involvement, and then you won't have too much to worry about. Now, hopefully that pendulum swings the other way, but I'm not really counting on it. And you really shouldn't hold your breath on that either. And as long as the pendulum gets stuck here in H-E double hockey sticks, then I wouldn't worry about any firings anytime soon. Now, this one gets me as I see other teachers on the internet complaining about how they don't really have some resolve. That baffles me. Oh, I had to spend my entire June lesson planning for next year. Like, who does that? I don't do that. Do you do that? Now, every year that I've been teaching, my summers have been mine. I take this time to add more to my paycheck. I'll teach three weeks of summer school. And even if I'm not spending my remaining summertime doing anything school related. Now, summers have also been an opportunity for me to spend time with the children that I gave birth to, doing more writing, creating more products to sell on the internet, and improving my overall content creation game. Now, I don't know what school districts some of these other teachers are working at, but they make it seem like you don't get paid once the summertime starts. And I got news for you. If you haven't left the profession and you're still under contract, you should still be receiving a paycheck based on the length of time your contract is in effect. So those teachers who aren't getting some sort of bag in the summertime, then I don't really know what to tell them. Now I've worked in the business world as a retail store manager and a website manager, and you have a finite amount of days you get off throughout the year. And when I was a new website manager back in 2019, I didn't get any time off because of that because I was under some probationary period. Like seriously, as a website manager, I had to work that full probationary year. And then the next, the following year, I would actually at least have banked one whole week off to take for a vacation, which kind of sucked in a way. It, it not in a way, it, it was just bad. Now in teaching, in this today, that's not the case. And it's never been the case. We're talking about a two-week winter break, one week's Thanksgiving break, spring break, summer break. Not to mention those single holidays such as Labor Day or Easter. Come on, the time off doesn't get any better than this. Now, it's no wonder why people of the past stayed in this profession for years without any issues. If things begin to improve, you'll begin to see people return to claim a spot in this field. But honestly, teachers hold the cards and one false move right now means that a person could leave at the drop of a dime. For me, this is a huge one as I've been blessed to work with some amazing people and build great relationships with the staff that I work with. Now, I look forward to seeing people that I work with, whether they actually like me or not. I don't really go to work with this unrealistic outlook of seeing my students like, yeah, I get to see my students again. Nope. You may actually say to yourself, then why are you teaching if it's not for the students? I think that a lot of teachers enter this profession with this these rose colored glasses they have a very rosy hollywood outlook based on all the way that movies have portrayed the classroom and there's a lot of movies that have not portrayed this profession well but then there are movies that have teachers with their head in the clouds like they're going to come in and just save every student so let me explain to you my whole outlook on the matter when it comes to actually teaching students students are always coming and going moody irrational one day they're up next day that they're down students are a byproduct of the climate and the culture of the school that you actually train up now if your school culture is game tight meaning that the rules are heavily enforced everyone is on run accord etc then kids will fall in line i've seen it happen over and over again but if the students see that the teachers are at odds with each other, administration is at odds with the teachers, there's all this infighting going on, then students will pick up on that and subconsciously go, oh, mommy and daddy are fighting again. Let's have some fun while they don't notice us. And that's what happens. In a climate such as this, that's when chaos ensues. Now, you may not be in the actual family because it is a job, because a lot of places of employment like to try to program you to think that hey we are family like you know steve urkel or something like that but i personally believe that you must operate as such though or at least at the very least get on the same program get your team all on the same mission and vision 
also have been blessed where people recognize the value that I add to the campus and I give credit to God on that because no one has to notice anything that I do. But the great I am allows people to see how much I do contribute and it encourages me even more to stay and be an asset as much as possible. I touched on this a little bit in an earlier uh, point of the video when discussing time off, but you cannot be guaranteed contractual pay. To know how much you're earning month to month or a bi-weekly basis is something that I personally need as a creature of habit and hating surprises or just changes in plans. Now, there are people who complain about taking their work home with them and teaching it, it is very easy to do that. However, I learned and mastered a long time ago what to take as a priority and what not to. I completely understand the feeling of being overwhelmed with the bombardment of emails, meetings, etc. But you need to only master the basics of the classroom. And those basics are classroom management, building student relationships, successfully connecting the content to the student and proper documentation when it comes to grading and behavior. That's it. Now we could wax on and wax off over philosophizing about the ills of education, but if you could do these four things, that's three, four, then you'll begin to feel more confident teaching where it will be, begin to be much easier. Back when I worked at Walgreens and I worked with a, a manager who actually made me mature as a man and young professional. Now he used to make these lists that everyone had to get done. And what I would have to learn how to do is to prioritize what's on the list versus the store's basic needs. Now, co-managers used to panic about the manager's list not really getting done, but if you could say with confidence that you took care of the store, taking care of his basic needs, like filling a milk shelf and making sure that the front of the store area looked good, and you could say that with confidence to your manager, I didn't get done with this list because the store had these other things that needed a sense of urgency, they may be mad, but in the long run, they'll be straight. Believe it or not, it's the same thing in teaching. So what you didn't submit the number of students that were going to play basketball in your classroom to the coach's email. Every email seems important. But ask yourself, does this boost my classroom performance or does it subtract from it? Learn the four basic pillars that I talked about earlier and then you can navigate and understand how to keep work at work in your personal life, your personal life, and never the two shall meet. Now I've learned to have systems in place when it comes to grading. My first year, I overthought my whole grading process, making things harder than what they needed to be and ended up having not enough grades the first six weeks of school. That little error cost me my first teaching job. Now ever since then, I knew I had to figure out an easier way to do my grades without stressing every six weeks about them. And if you're teaching high school or middle school, that's an average of 100 plus kids you have to put grades in for. So you have to come up with a system. However, with the technology we have today, I personally think it's really easy to be a teacher. From my experience, it's, teaching today is no time to be a teacher like it is right now, where it's much easier in terms of the technology that we possess and coming up with materials for our lesson plans and coming up with things on the fly, those sorts of things. I mean, educational software and programs that we have now, it collects the data and it practically grades things for you. And most of the software that we use, it, it cross communicates with each other. So those of you that are familiar with Canvas and use some grade book like Skyward or Teams, if you download the whole the CV or whatever export the spreadsheet file is, you can easily like just upload it to that system and it'll just communicate with each other. Now, since I've been teaching in 2014, just like Don's wrapped only needing one mic, all I need is a projector, <laughs> the internet, a laptop and a projector screen. Now that's more than one mic, but you, you get where I'm going with this. With all that said, I keep my setup simple, my system's doing all the work for me, which allows me to keep my work at work, after school is tended to the family, and side hustle time. And teaching affords me that lifestyle. Last and certainly not least, is the fact that I teach an elective which has kept me in education a lot longer than I actually expected. But of my eight years in this career, three I've taught English and five I've taught technology. Now, don't get me wrong, the three English years were pretty good, but to be honest, the requirements and teaching the core content are things I could just do without. Many people complain about standardized testing, but that has never bothered me personally. Testing always gave me a goal to reach that, and to reach that goal, I would come up with new ways to teach reading skills such as summarization and inferring. I'm a rarity where I approach standardized testing from a gaming perspective. We have these scores to reach, and I always ask myself, 
how can I level up my students to help them become better and attain the necessary scores that they need? And I would give kids their own personal achievements to hit that fit their current levels and reading abilities. But despite that core content areas such as math, English, social studies, science, they're, they're way too demanding for me to care about sticking around and just teaching any of that. Now, when I switched to teaching technology, I got to focus on teaching students basic productivity skills when it comes to computers and the internet. Things such as touch typing and using PowerPoint and spreadsheets while also introducing them to basic code and fundamentals and other web design elements, which is my secondary career path. When I get to teach the kids this, I can see a more practical outcome such as their typing speed increasing right before my very eyes and being more confident to use a computer and actually writing on it. And if they take the coding aspect seriously, they end up diving deeper into that industry, studying all about it, making little simple games and websites just from doing that. It's a more rewarding experience for me as a teacher than trying to pull teeth when it comes to encouraging kids to be better readers. Also, when teaching English, there's this set script usually for teachers to follow and you have to find ways, creative ways within that script in order to get the material out. And finding that creativity, in my opinion, is very necessary because if you're just following along with this set plan that the district has laid out for you to follow in order to teach their required material, you can actually find your job to be very soul crushing because there's very little fulfillment in terms of you being able to spread your wings and to adapt your personality and creativity to with the material that you're trying to connect with the students. But that required script is the sort of legalities that I'm talking about when it comes to teaching a core content subject. The state says that you have to teach these skills in this order by the time testing comes around. And then the district on top of that then adds you have you have to teach this story with this vocabulary set on top of this on top of that etc man one of my pet peeves in teaching english is covering a historical story that usually is about some native american family that the kids nor i really do care about and without fail every year there seems to be five native american stories that cause me to go to sleep being of no interest not only to myself but the students also. And because I teach at a Title I school, these are kids who are smitten with horror films, Marvel movies, Drake, and Future. So then there's that. Now, these are the seven reasons why I'm still in education and why I'm probably not going to leave for a while unless, one, God repositions me otherwise, or two, the cultural climate becomes too wild with the infusion of these silly identity politics and social media that is contaminating our students completely. And trust me, when, it, when that day comes, my Teachers Pay Teachers store will already be on deck, ready to go. Speaking of Teachers Pay Teachers, I think that's a concern you should have if this teacher exodus continues for many more years to come. And if you have no teachers in the classroom, then who are you going to sell to? I talk about that apocalypse right over here in this video. Now, see if you have anything to worry about when it comes to your store and this teaching crisis we're experiencing. Right over here. Go there now.